Welcome to a Slapshot edition of the Russian Rulers podcast. Today, we're going to go over Muscovite thought and literature. In addition to the issue of the true faith, the issue of the proper form of government preoccupied certain Muscovite minds. It concerned essentially the nature and the new role of autocracy, and discussion of it continued the intellectual trend clearly observable in the reigns of Ivan III and Vasily III. Such publicists as Ivan Perovestov, who wrote in the middle of the 16th century, upheld the new power and authority of the Tsar, while the events of the time of troubles provided variations on this theme of proper government, and seemed to offer to the Russians unwanted political experience. The most famous debate on the subject took place between Ivan the Terrible and Prince Andrew Kurbsky, in two letters from the Tsar and five from the fugitive nobleman, written between 1564 and 1579. The sovereign's brilliant letters strike the reader by the sweep of their assertions and their grandiose tone. Ivan the Terrible believed in the divine foundation of autocracy, and he declared that, even if he were a tyrant, Kurbsky's only alternative as a Christian and a faithful subject remained patient suffering. The prince, on his part, proved to be stronger in his criticism of the Tsar's conduct and in personal invective than in political theory. Yet his views, too, presented a system of belief. They hearkened back to an earlier order of things, when no great gulf separated the ruler from his chief lieutenants, and when an aristocrat enjoyed more freedom and more respect than Ivan IV wanted to follow. In foreign relations, as in domestic matters, Ivan the Terrible and other Tsars reiterated the glory of autocracy and demanded full respect for it. They considered the Polish kings degraded because the latter had been put on their throne by others, and thus could not be regarded as hereditary or rooted rulers. They asked why the Swedish monarchs treated their advisers as companions or to quote the, frequ the frequently mentioned bitter letter of Ivan the Terrible to Elizabeth I of England, written in 1570, quote, We had thought that you were sovereign in your state and ruled yourself, and that you saw to your sovereign honor and to the interests of the country. But it turns out that in your land people rule beside you, and not only people, but trading peasants. Passing on to the subject of Muscovite literature as a whole, one should note the development of the chancellery language based on the Muscovite spoken idiom in which official documents were written, and also the gradual penetration of popular language into the literature in place of the bookish Slavonic Russian. Avakum's autobiography, written in the racy spoken idiom, was a milestone in Russian literature. Religious writings continued and indeed flourished, especially in the 17th century. They included hagiography, and in particular, menologia, that is, calendars with the lives of saints arranged under the dates of their respective feasts, the most important of which was compiled by Metropolitan Macarius. They also included theological and polemical works, sermons, and other items. After Ukraine joined Muscovy, the more learned and less isolated Ukrainian clerics began to play a major role in a Russian literary revival. The domostroy, or house manager, constituted one of the most noteworthy works of Muscovite Russia, attributed to Sylvester and dating in its original version from about 1556. It intends in 63 didactic chapters to instruct the head of a Muscovite family and its other members how properly to run their house households and lead their lives. The Domostroy teachings reflect the ritualism, piety, severity, and patriarchal nature of Muscovite society. Some commentators have noted in horror that the author, or more likely authors, write in the same peremptory manner about the veneration of the Holy Trinity and about the preservation of mushrooms. Possibly the most cited directive reads, Punish your son in his youth, and he will give you a quiet old age and restfulness to your soul. Weaken not beating the boy, for he will not die from your striking him with the rod, but he will be in better health, 
for while you strike his body, you save his soul from death. If you love your son, punish him frequently, and that you may rejoice later. If the Domostroi, with its remarkable ritualism, formalism, and emphasis on the preservation of appearances, is considered by some to be a kind of Muscovite summa, other events in the literature, especially in the 17th century, pointed in new directions. Gradually, the lay literature of the West spread in Russia, coming through Poland, Ukraine, the Balkans, and sometimes more directly, the stories assumed a romantic, didactic, or satirical character, and were usually full of adventure, which the religious writings of ancient Russia, as a rule, lacked. Often, though, the vehicle of such recurrent themes as the tales of the seven wise men, or of Tristan and Isolde, the stories acquainted Muscovites with the world of knighthood, courtly love, and other concepts and practices unknown in the realm of the Tsars. Soon, Russian tales following Western models made their appearance. For instance, stories about Sava Grudsin, who sold his soul to the devil, and about the rogue Frol Zokbiev. Numbers of these tales also enjoyed great popularity. Syllabic versification also came from the West, from the Latin and the Polish languages, largely through the efforts of Simeon of Polotsk, who died in 1680. It remained the dominant form in Russian poetry until the middle of the 18th century. After some productions of plays arranged by private individuals, Tsar Alexis established a court theater in 1672 under the direction of a German pastor, Johann Gregory. Before long, a few Russian plays enriched the repertoire, which was devoted primarily to biblical subjects. The traditional oral literature of the people continued to thrive throughout the Muscovite period. Tales and songs commemorated such significant events as the capture of Kazan, the penetration into Siberia, or Stenka Razin's rebellion. The Bailani retained their popularity. Pilgrims and beggars composed religious poems at venerated shrines. The Skomoroki went on to entertaining the people in spite of all prohibitions. All in all, it seems quite unfair to characterize Muscovite culture as silent, as has sometimes been done, all the more so because it is probable that many writings of the period have been lost. On the other hand, Muscovite literary life does not appear meager or does appear meager by comparison with the riches of its contemporary West. Nor did it measure up, in the opinion of specialists, to Muscovite architecture and other arts. And those arts we're going to go over in the next Slapshot, Slapshot podcast. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. I'm sorry that I haven't uh, kept up with the ruler's end. Uh, I want to spend a little bit more time than is usually given on Sophia. Uh, it takes a little bit more work to dig up all the information about her because after she was uh, deposed by Peter, uh, a lot of negative uh, historians you know, came out about her uh, to appease Peter, I'm sure. So uh, anyways, it will come out this week, and just rest assured and be patient. Uh, please come by the uh, website at russianrulers.podhoster.com. Become a Facebook friend. We're starting to get a nice little uh, repertoire of friends out there, and I appreciate the comments that you've been making on the Facebook page. Uh, please uh, leave a comment, make a suggestion, ask a question. And as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.